All right, this is Jeremiah 15, verse 10. Kevin, if you have a word, interrupt me. All right, Jeremiah's complaint. Then I said, what sorrow is mine? Now, we're talking about Jeremiah the prophet. What sorrow is mine, my mother? Oh, that I had died at birth. I am hated everywhere I go. I am neither a lender who threatens to foreclose, nor a borrower who refuses to pay, yet they all curse me. The Lord replied, I will take care of you, Jeremiah. (laughs) Everybody was cursing Jeremiah. But the Lord said, I will take care of you, Jeremiah. Let me, uh, Jeremiah 15, 10. Let me just say, if the thought just crossed your mind, oh, I would love that. Let me tell you, you have that. You have the same promise. But if you wish somebody else would take care of you, and somebody else taking, if somebody else taking care of you would mean more to you than God taking care of you, this is why God is not enough for you. God said, I will take care of you, Jeremiah. Well, God has promised to take care of you. I, w- I want you to start seeing yourself as, as special to God as Jeremiah, as special to God as Moses, as special to God. Jesus said in his prayer that God loves us as much as he loves Jesus. Did you know that? You know, before I read it for myself, revealed by the Holy Spirit, if someone had said, who does God love more, you or Jesus, I'd be like, oh, Jesus. But Jesus said he loves me as much as he loves Jesus. So what I want to present, among other things tonight maybe, is how, how special is God to us? If we understand that we are his treasure, that frees us up to treasure him, his opinion, and his promise of protection. So, I will take care of you, Jeremiah. Your enemies will ask you to plead on their behalf in times of trouble and distress. Can a man break a bar of iron from the north? or a bar of bronze, at no cost to them I will hand over your wealth and treasures as plunder to your enemies, for sin runs rampant in your land. Do you know that sin makes God angry? It always has. Sin is not a laughing matter. Sin is no bueno. Is that how you say it? Yep. <laughs> Isn't there another word for no? <laughs> no bueno. Sin is no bueno. Sin is not a joke. Like, it's not cute. It's not, I'm in sin. <laughs> We're going to let that one just sit for a minute. You would think that would be obvious in our church, but we need to just say it again. Sin's not cute. It will kill you. The wages of sin, the wages of sin, the wages of sin is death. So we don't laugh at sin. It's not cute. We don't coddle it. We don't babysit it. We don't cover over it. We don't like, you know, you're so cute. You can sin. It's fine. You're a baby. You better stop sinning. (laughs) Amen, Jesus. It's always made God mad. Now, Jesus paid the price so we don't have to pay for our sins. But he did not pay that price for us to stay. He did not pay for us to stay. God did not, Jesus did not pay the price for your sin for you to 
stay in your sin. He paid the price for your sin so you can come out of sin. Amen? All right. I will tell your enemies to take you as captives to a foreign land, for my anger blazes like a fire that will burn forever. Then I said, now this is Jeremiah talking, so if you have kind of gain some boldness and love for the Lord and and you feel like you're speaking boldly for the Lord and you address some situations in a godly way. Let's just listen to what happened with Jeremiah. Lord, you know what's happening to me. Please step in and help me. <laughs> Punish my persecutors. Please give me time. Don't let me die young. It's for your sake that I'm suffering. When I discovered your words, I devoured them. Who feels like that? Who has that feeling? When I discovered the Bible. Oh, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name. Oh, Lord God of heaven's armies, I never joined the people in their merry feasts. I sat alone because your hand was on me. I was filled with indignation at their sins. Who can relate to that? And who can relate to this? Why then does my suffering continue? Why is my wound so incurable? Your help seems as uncertain as a seasonal brook, like a spring that has gone dry. And this is how the Lord responds. Jeremiah, (laughs) if you return to me, I will restore you. Faithful, yes, to his word. And clearly, Jeremiah was not as close as he had been. The Lord is faithful. Faithful to his word. And so there were some conditions on healing Jeremiah. And it was Jeremiah returning to the Lord, just like Jesus says to the church in Revelation. Being the church, being a prophet, does not guarantee anything as far as proximity to Jesus. Staying close to Jesus guarantees closeness to Jesus. A gift from Jesus does not guarantee closeness to Jesus. Closeness to Jesus guarantees closeness to Jesus. You know, when I asked Roland Baker for help with you all, he said, just don't let them take Jesus from you. So I've spent a little time on that, and now I want to help you in a way, sort of. I mean, I do, but I don't. I mean, I asked the Lord for a do-over because he came to me and he said, what do you want? And I said, to help people get to you. And in the last month, I said, can I redo that? I don't know if I can redo that or not. If I can redo that, I'd like to change my answer. (laughs) I said it out loud in my bathroom. I said, I'd like a do-over, please, Lord. I'm not sure if it counts, but if I could have a do-over, I would say I want to stay close to you. And I mean, uh, for the record, the Lord is asking me again, what do you want? I want to stay close to him, period. And I feel like me being close to him might make one of the other people get close to him, but me trying to help people get close to him took me a little further away from him. So I asked for a do-over, and I believe the Lord's going to grant that request. So I no longer, it's no longer my main thing to help people get to Jesus, only to stay with him, because I'm not taking any chances with my own eternity, my own life. I'm not 
don't drink me. And I suggest you do the same. So closeness to Jesus, clean your teeth, closeness to Jesus. Not a position in the church, not a reputation among people, not a reputation as a fiery church that does not guarantee closeness to Jesus. The churches in Revelation had a good reputation with men. They looked like they were on fire, but they were not. So closeness to Jesus guarantees closeness to Jesus. And that's all. Say, that's all. all. Your heart for people does not guarantee closeness to Jesus. There's a distinct, vast difference between your heart for people and your heart for Jesus. Don't mistake it. Spend lots of time every day pursuing the heart of Jesus. You know how to make other people feel loved. Do you know how to make Jesus feel loved? Do we know how to make him feel loved and wanted? So stay close to Jesus. That is uh, my top request now is that I will stay with Jesus. So here's Jeremiah, one of the one of the most famous prophets of God. And and he's questioning the Lord, and the Lord says, If you return to me, I will restore you. This is Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. This is Jeremiah. Do you hear me? This is Jeremiah. If you return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. If you speak good words rather than worthless ones, you will be my spokesman. You must influence them. Do not let them influence you. They will fight against you like an attacking army. But I will make you as secure as a fortified wall of bronze. They will not conquer you, for I am with you to protect and rescue you. I, the Lord, have spoken. Yes, I will certainly keep you safe from these wicked men. I will rescue you from their cruel hands. Do not get married. (laughs) Just kidding. That, that is the next part, but <laughs> we'll stop right there. <laughs> I can't just say, yes, Lord. okay, Lord. <laughs> I mean, it's there. Anyway, so. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you say? Oh, Jesus. Let's see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Amy said, take up an offering, and all of EOJ runs to the altar. That's right. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. <laughs> What's up, Moses? Okay. Okay. Um. So, yesterday, or the day before, I'm trying to remember. When did you send that dream to me today, Michaela? Okay, so it was yesterday. Um, Can I read the dream? Okay, so yesterday I felt the Lord um, ask me basically um, if, if I would let him, if he could look through my eyes on social media. Like, in other words, I'm a little direct with y'all, especially one-on-one, depending. But if I have a word from the Lord, you know, we'll just go all the way there. Sometimes on social media, I'm a little more laid back, a little more, you know, and I don't know. I just felt, I felt like he was like, will you let me look through your eyes at people? And I said, yes, Lord. 
And Michaela sent this dream to me from last night. Thank you, Lord. Uh, I keep thinking about this dream I had last night. She said she thought it was real so much, like, and she's you started not to send it right or something. You thought it already happened, like it was so real to her. She thought it had happened, so I already knew about it. Does that make sense? Right, basically. There were people praying according to their will, and others were praying according to the Lord's will. There was a mixture in the room. Some who believed that God was someone they could just attach to their lives, and others who believed that they had to fully give up their lives to receive his. Some were hungry for God. Others were hungry for what God could give them, miracles, gifts, etc., you went around praying. She's talking to me now. You went around praying, asking who wanted Jesus. You looked in their eyes and asked them. And those who truly wanted God humbled themselves and fell to their knees crying. The others wouldn't open their eyes because they were too busy trying to pull down a miracle and break through from heaven. It felt like a battle in the spirit. I woke up all night praying for the people in my dreams, praying that we would be hungry for God and humble ourselves before him. I kept thinking about the scripture, Second Chronicles 16, 9, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this, therefore from now on you will have wars. It was like Jesus was looking through you to see whose heart is actually his. And I just said yesterday, pretty much like, yes, Lord, I'll let you look with burning eyes into people. Um, and then yesterday, Kevin and I were having a conversation. And at some point, um, and he can talk more about this, it's just like, how can we help people get more, like, serious about the gospel, about, you know? So last night, right before bed, I felt the Lord. Uh, I did one of the <laughs> the girls early on when they were living with me. Uh, it came up with a way to do a Bible flip if you didn't have a paper Bible with you, you know? And it's like you put on your version, <laughs> and you just spin... And I'll do it several times to make sure that I don't know where it is. And then boom, and then boom. And so it landed on Haggai. So I just listened to Haggai. And it was so, so cool. Like, clearly, that's exactly where the Lord wanted me. Because then it said in Haggai um, 1, verse 14, So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the enthusiasm of Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the enthusiasm of the whole remnant of God's people. They began to work on the house of their God in the, the Lord of Heaven's armies on September 21st of the second year of King Darius's reign. And then this morning, I get a message I'll leave them unnamed unless they are suddenly like, hey, you can share that with me. I don't care. Probably will and probably wouldn't. But listen, I woke up burning, like woke up crying because he's coming back for a pure bride. I woke up so aware that I need and want to know and be aware of what really matters. Jesus, knowing him, like I woke up almost hearing Paul shout, remember what really matters. I pray that uh, Kevin and I keep the grace to remember to surrender y'all. Every time we re-surrender y'all, it's like, woo. <laughs> this is truly his church. He really is our leader. And he sparks the enthusiasm. He brings the conviction that's needed, right? In a way that we never could. We could try and try and try, and, and there's just no shot. I want to read a couple more scriptures and then turn to hu uh, husband. <laughs> Where are our boys? 
Where are they? Elijah. Shiloh. Pronto. So, he started with so. <laughs> so nothing, sit down. Okay. <laughs> okay, I want to just say a couple things right here. Thank you, Lord. Acts 20. You're getting food. You can get it right there at that, that back table, but stay in this room. Thank you, Lord. Okay, this is just how I'm feeling, okay, y'all? Acts 20, 26. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. So, guard yourselves and God's people. What's up, y'all? Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers, like vicious wolves, will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and many te- my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. Also, Paul said, please bear with me. For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you, this is 2 Corinthians 11, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of of the serpent you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you even if they preach a different jesus than the one we preach or a different kind of spirit than the one you received or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed and this was paul y'all this was early church This was not even 2021. So if y'all ever thought in your mind, maybe they're a little too serious, you have not seen anything yet. We, if we were serious before, we're amping it up about like a thousand because Jesus is coming soon and people are going to hell and there is a hell with fire that burns forever. And Satan is amping it up. So we are too. We will no longer soften the approach so mo- more people can hear. Because we didn't even know we were doing it. But in some ways I was doing it. Okay? We're not doing that anymore. Part of me has felt like, well, maybe just it'll give people a little more access. More people no. No, what they're hearing is pure nonsense, and they're buying it. So if anybody ever hears my voice, I want them to hear that there is a distinct difference between the real gospel and all the false gospels. A distinct, there is a clear difference. There is a clear difference. You must know the one you say you believe. 
You cannot just believe in a gospel. You must believe in Jesus. See, it's not enough to believe in a certain doctrine. You can't say, oh, yeah, I believe that. You believe that, but do you know him? Do you just believe that, or do you love Jesus? Jesus is real. Jesus is actual. Jesus is not an idea. Jesus is not a principle. Jesus is not a set of rules. Jesus is real, and he has real feelings about how you really feel about him, and he hates sin. He hates sin, and the Holy Ghost will burn it out of you. You should not be ever as a Christian, as a true Christian, if you are comfortable living in sin, what has happened to you? And the way to change that is live in the word. Live in the word. Be filled with his spirit and live in his word. His word will, will bring to life all that needs to be brought to life in you, the word and the spirit. Read the word to find him, not to find your answer, not to find exactly what doctrine you believe. That's good only to a certain point. But, y'all, time is wrapping up. And one thing we were talking about at lunch uh, earlier today, I've only talked about this to a few people, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it right now. I'm not positive that this is the case, but what if this is the case? The Bible says... Um, let me see. In Matthew 24, 5, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Okay, so what we were talking about at lunch today is most of us would be like if somebody said, I'm Jesus. Like somebody said that to Caroline on the plane the other day. And Caroline was pretty sure, and it was pretty proven, the person was drunk. Like if somebody comes up to you and says, I'm Jesus, you're going to know you're full of it, right? But how about, but how about this? Don't miss it. How about this? How about I am Christ and you are Christ? And Buddha is Christ. And Shiva's Christ. And everyone's Christ. Well, that's a new doctrine. But it's not real new. But this is going like wildfire from former worship leaders. One of the presidential um, nominees for this last presidential campaign, she believed that. I am the Christ and you're the Christ. There was someone in our church not too long ago that sent out a sermon saying, from this man who was preaching, and he said, we no longer do altar calls. That's unnecessary. Whether it's a Buddhist or a Hindu, they already have Christ in them. They just need to be introduced to him. So some of you may have, okay, who's heard this? Who's heard this kind of teaching so far? All right, who has not? Okay, so now you have your inoculation, (laughs) as Dr. Media says. It is completely false, and what they will say is that um, basically, I don't even remember what they said, because it's so ridiculous. I don't even, even repeat it. It's so stupid. But what I'm saying is, like, if somebody rises up, and like we're talking, Antichrist, now I'm not saying that there won't be one man that says, I really am Christ. But how much more likely Christians by the hundreds, thousands, maybe millions now, are accepting this crap of like, oh, everybody's Christ. Oh, this is so much better than we thought. No heaven, no hell. Everybody's fine. You just got to accept it. That is not the gospel. Everyone is not fine. Sin is sin. We need to repent. There is one Christ. We are going to marry him. There is a hell. There is a heaven. There will be a judgment day. And you will not be judged according to what you felt. No, one, they, they're not, no one's going to be judged according to what you felt, but according to his word. So if anybody starts telling you now or 10 years from now or however long we have to live on this earth, you know what? You don't really need the Bible. This is all we have. 
Otherwise, it's men's opinion. And, and the Bible talks about this, that people will make up their own God. They will make up their own God. And this is exactly, we're watching it happen now. And Christians everywhere are falling for it because they don't have a real relationship with Jesus. And so they're just like, oh, that sounds good. That sounds good. That sounds so much more loving. And so do you understand, like, this is just my personal opinion of what could possibly be. It could be that we're already watching the great apostasy, which means the falling away. And what is really concerning to me is that it's not going to look like people like I am falling away. They will be falling away, having no clue they are falling away. No clue, thinking they found the truth. Not even maybe people going, I don't even care about truth anymore, but like desperately looking for answers. Going, oh, this is awesome. This is so much. I, I had lunch with a guy one time. He was at, at service, and then afterwards, we all had lunch with him. He just pulled me to another table, and he said, listen, I have a question for you. Everything that you're preaching is like, wow, but but, but if I sign on to this, this is not good for my friends. And it goes against everything I've been taught. And he said, so I want to stay with what I'm hearing you teach because I see it is in the Bible. But it's not good for my friends. So if I accept this, this is not good news for how they live. But if I go back to what I've always believed, how many pages of this do I have to tear out? Well, now there are plenty of people saying, don't worry about that. If it doesn't look kind and loving, disregard it. And for some reason, people are buying it. So I just want to send out a warning. Many people will fall away and have no clue that they are falling away into hell. And that can't be undone. The afterlife, after this life, there's no changing it. And I'm just wondering, like, people, you know, I really want to start talking about this on my social media because I only know, like, two people, personal friends of mine, one I've never really met, but friends through a relative. They're a basket case. They're, like, some days really direct and awesome, and some days they're, like, I don't know, I'm going to freak out over here, and then they'll do something to center themselves make themselves feel better and take the plunge and go for it because many people need to get free of their PTSD and this is the way, it's not so bad, like it's way better than we thought it was, you know. And I'm just thinking, once they die, unless they repent, return to the Lord, and when people die and they find themselves at Judgment Day, what in the world is going to comfort them? Because it would be God, God they're facing. They're not going to have their friend group. They're not going to have their therapist. They're not going to have their yoga session. They're not going to have their followers to pump them up. Like, thank you for setting me free. Thank you for sharing this. When we die, it will be us and God. And we will be judged according to what he said in this word. Not what our friends said. Not what our mentor said. Not what our parents said. Not what our therapist said. Not even what our pastor said. The word of God. And it's very, the the best search you could have in your day, every day, is the search for Jesus. And what his word says. It's really serious, y'all. It is no joke. And some people don't want to believe in, in hell anymore because of PTSD. And we're talking, can you imagine PTSD after death? Like, you talk about post-trauma that never ends. I'm serious. I see more and more people saying they don't want to read the Bible, they don't want to go to church because it just gives them trauma, it just gives them stress. They just have PTSD. Yes, I've talked to, I talked personally to a guy who's, he said his Christian counselor said, you know, Your legalistic upbringing gives you so much stress, better for you not to even read the Bible. Out of his mouth, he told me this. 
So I get it if it's just if it's just religion, if it's just condemnation, if it's just telling somebody to, to obey a bunch of rules. I get it. I was traumatized by that too. I get that. But real relationship with Christ, this is our only hope. We're all dying. We got here dying in a minute. And remember, maybe ask Kevin or whatever. We got here dying. The day you're born, you're dying. You are heading toward. Listen, this is not a joke. How we live here determines how we'll live after we die. We do not have time to numb out. Don't numb out on video games. Don't numb out on social media. Don't numb out on food. Don't numb out on anything. You need to wake up. Wake up to the reality of Christ and his love. Jesus and his love, the one who died for you. Because I'm telling you, we are coming into a place darker and darker. And now more and more leaders and worship leaders are selling. And I'm seeing people who I thought were pretty, pretty on track, teaming up with people who are so off track, you don't even know they, they knew about a track. So then, like we were talking yesterday, so then, you know, if, if people who follow a worship leader that seem relatively safe, but now they're with this person, then they're like, oh, that's fine too. Oh, okay, everything's fine. See, see, I was worried for nothing. Everything's fine. No, everything's not fine. You can't just live how you want to live. So it's like, yay, Jesus, do you want to dance? Yes, do you want to dance with Jesus or the world? Jesus wants to dance with you. That's a given. Jesus wants to love you. In fact, Jesus wants to marry you. <laughs> Who do you want to marry? Who do you want to dance with? Who makes you feel good? So it's real serious. It's serious for us, and it's serious for your family, and it's serious for your neighbors, and it's serious for the city of Nashville, and it's serious for America, and it doesn't matter what people believe. The truth is the truth. And it's not finding out more about yourself that will set you free. Forget yourself. Find Jesus. I'm serious. I heard a pastor say, you know, the truth will set you free, make you free. Find out more about yourself. Get a therapist or something. Are you kidding me? No, it is Jesus, the truth, that sets you free. Yeah. Knowing him and who he is, forget the search for the real you. It is the real Jesus we need to find. You will not even find your real self until the day Christ returns. The Bible says, as believers, your real self, your real life is hidden in Christ. Why are you trying to find something that is hidden in Christ? Everybody's looking for the real them. You can't find the real you as a believer. It is hidden in Christ with God. Give up your search for you. And if you need to give it up every day, then give it up every day. I love Smith Wigglesworth. He said, if you are seeking holiness and you fall every day, seek it again the next day. If you stumble every day, find him again the next day. I was listening to a minister earlier today, and I just love it. He said, if you're tired of feeling guilty over the same things, your answer is stay in the word. The word will fill you up. How can a young person stay pure? Meditating on his word. How can a young person stay pure? What a question. By meditating on his word day and night. How can you be freed from your fears? Meditate on his word day and night. <laughs> because I'm telling you, you can come here and get delivered once a week. And if you're not meditating on his word and you don't believe in his word, it'll all come back worse. Yeah. <laughs> 
this world's a mess. And the Bible says if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. So it's time to choose. He already chose you. He chose you. You choose. Many of you have chosen. I'm talking to anybody who hasn't, and probably more, especially online, but I don't know, right? Because I don't know your heart. But Jesus does, and he loves you. He loves you. He gave his life for you. He gave, he loved you so much. God loves you so much. He loves you so much. He wants you to be free of the fear. He wants you to be free of sin. He hates what sin has done to his people. He's not blaming you. He's not like, oh, you're you're just an idiot. I'll try to help you out again. He loves you. He loves you. And he's given all of us the faith we need to love him. So let's love him and let's tell more people. Let's tell more people. Time is running out. There's no doubt by mine. I've never been more convinced we're in the end time. Time is running out. So choose your pursuit. Choose your pursuit, and I encourage you to let it be Jesus. Make him your full-time job. At your job, pursue Jesus. At your house, pursue Jesus. When you wake up, pursue Jesus. 